Hello and welcome to A Closer Look with Mark Miller and Mark Shine. And Mark, this is our special Valentine's Day show. And look what our producer yeah, Joe Vernick that? did for us. Got us a little bear. Chocolate with strawberries. Right. Oh, man. Did you get your sweetheart a card? Or uh, right, here's my stuff right here. I'm, 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 I'm <laughs> absconding with this and taking it home to her. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, during the highlights, we can have a chocolate. Yeah, there you go. All right. Dribbling down. <laughs> All right. Hey, we also want to uh, mention our show that we did uh, with the bracket show, the postseason preview show we did on Sunday night, and hope you had a chance to take a look at that. But uh, that was a lot of fun, and Sean Boley and Nick Burke joined us, and we were able to run down all the brackets, yep. and I feel like I know what I'm expecting a lot more now. Well, it certainly is online now, and now we're waiting for Ben Reif, our producer, our executive producer, to put the schedule together so we know where we're going to be every week in the tournament. Well, we want to thank Layfield yep. Welding and Frickers and Van Wert for helping us sponsor that show, and let's get going. we got stat okay, stuffers. All right, do. I'm the first guy. Yep. Eric Ritter, Corey Ross, and 16 points versus Riverdale. Came back with 28 points, including six threes against USV. Corey has won four in a row and five of their last six. I've got Riley Adolph from Van Buren to go, wait a minute, the guy's got 12 points. What's the big deal about that? Well, he's had this bad ankle. He made 12 points on four three-point field goals against Lipsick. Now we think he's back. He had eight rebounds in a game last night. If you've got a bad wheel, you're ready to go and jump against guys like from USV. Got a bad wheel and you're able to do that. He must be getting healthy. That's good for uh, Van Buren. That's a late season shot yeah. in the arm, getting ready for tournament. Aaron Ernst from Minster, 17 points, three threes in their win over New Knoxville. 24 points, six threes. Man, they're filling it up from the yeah. outside. In a win over St. Mary's, Minster has won three of their last four. And he can flat shoot the basketball. We had him down there the other night down at uh, St. Mary's when Minster defeated St. Mary's. How about a Ryan Monford from Perry? We're having trouble picking out highlight guys from Perry, but he's been the leading scorer recently. Orion had 21 with a couple of threes in their win over Temple, and that clinched a conference win for Perry, and they now will be the NWCC champions again. Luke Trentman from Fort Jennings, 17 points, five threes, and Ian Finn pitched in with 17 points and a couple of threes in their win over New Bremen. Fort Jennings has won three in a row in four of their last five. We're seeing a lot of these teams yep. get on late season rolls. Talked to Coach from Fort Jennings last night. He said, yep, we got it going. Our juniors finally got things figured out. Good to see for them. Noah Lambert at Kaleida had 16 with three threes in a big win over Miller City. That kind of threw the PCL race all up in the air. We'll talk about that towards the end of the show. But a good for him. And then he made 21 points on seven threes. Three times seven is 21 hey. in a loss to state rank Ayersville. Hey, here's a familiar name, Kyle Nunn from Finley. We saw him earlier in the year. He had 18 in the game-winning putback against St. Francis in that big upset in the track. His brother, R.J. Nunn, had 18 points and four threes in that win as well. Okay, Thomas Phillips from Kenton. We talked about Kenton already this year multiple times, how they got a bunch of guys who can score. Thomas had 15 in their close loss in the WBL to Elida. Came back with 33, including a made three-point field goal in their win over Alan East. Thomas Phillips got it going. Kenton's one of my picks that go do some damage in the tournament. Nate Place from Van Wert had 13 points in their win over Salina, 18 points and a couple of threes in their win over St. Henry. Van Wert also on a roll has won four of their last five. And our last stat stuffer guy today is Jar Ward from Lyme Messina. Just keeps filling it up for them. He had 29 in their win over Fremont Ross. We're going to come back to the Spartans later on in this game in the script when we talk about the uh, league and where the track is at right now. But Jar's having a great year for the Spartans. He, he is a weekly installment he, on the we, stats we stuff, just, isn't he? We should just video those things to keep showing right. week after week after week. Well, our play of this week, Mark, actually have a couple of them. We were over at Crestview the other night for a great game with Crestview and Spencerville. We've got one highlight from each team. The first one, just pure athlete. <laughs> well, this is going to be a great play by Drew Klein, who wears number 10. He's going to make an interception, go with a basket and score and draw contact. Uh, what makes this even such a huge play is Spencerville's up right now. They're up seven. They have the basketball. They're going to right towards the end of the half. They have a chance to go up nine, maybe ten. And instead, we're going to see this play by Klein. First of all, here he is right here at the top of the circle. This is pure athleticism right here because not only goes up and right here makes the interception, but then watch the behind-the-back pass to himself. You've coached some defensive backs in your career before. That's a defensive back he play right there, isn't it? it? Yeah. yeah, the word they're all using now is high point it. He was definitely high. And he went up and goes to the rim and scores. That's a huge play in the game. And then we're going to get a play towards the end of the game. And this is one of those situations where Crestview is down. Uh, Spenceville is trying to, to hang on to the game. Crestview is going for the game winner. And we're going to watch the steal here by Dakota Pritchard. He wears number 41. Klein comes off and makes a really nice steal, does Pritchard. Takes the ball to midcourt. He's going to get over midcourt. And he's going to call timeout right here and then. This is a controversial situation right here. We'll replay again in just a second. Let's go look at the whole play over again because you can see how Coach Best reacts to this one. 
Here's the play again. Here's the dribble drive penetration. Watch the strip right here. Nice play without a foul. And then as Pritchard gets over midcourt, he's going to pick the basketball up right in here. And as he does, let's watch his reaction right here. He wants to call timeout. The Crestview you guys want to steal or a foul and watch him swing those elbows because, first of all, he could have been called for a violation for swinging the elbows. Second, if he makes contact with either elbow, that's a foul and would have put Crestview at the line. I think it's a pretty good no call by the official in a very dramatic situation. But watch the elbow swing right here, and he could have got himself and his team in some trouble right there. And watch how Coach uh, Best is going to come in from the side right here and react a little bit. He sees what's going on, and he says, hey, I want to call. But timeout had already been called. I think it's a good no call, but that could have been a difficult situation for Spencer right there after a great steal. All right. Hey, let's look at our bright spot. And you know our crew does a great job. They get there hours before the game, and they set up. We just walk in and call the game. And then afterwards, they got to stick around and tear it all down and bring it home. That's a long night for yeah. them. But it's during the game gets a little dangerous, too, because some of our camera yeah. guys are down, <clears throat> excuse me, down on the floor. Yeah. And we got Aaron Baker. This was Fairlawn and Lincoln View. And let's run this. He's at the end of the court, and he almost gets bowled right over. You see the big, that's a big guy right yeah, there. Right watch Aaron. Him. But watch, he never flinches. Camera is right there. He kind of. Puts his arm out to protect it. He's still taking video. Yeah, he Those us, guys deserve hazard pay sometimes, don't told they? told us after the game he had to go wipe the sweat off on the mat there <laughs> on, the end of the, on the end of the court with what happened. So yeah. our bright spot is our crew. They yeah. do a great job. They absolutely do. All right, where are they now? Last week we gave you the over 500 victory coaches from the area, and we missed a few, Mark. We missed three great coaches. There you can see them on the screen. Yep. Wow, Steve Willeman, 551 up at Liberty Benton, also at Old Fort. Started and off at Galleon, Galleon. that's where you Galleon. knew him. Yeah, I knew him at Galleon. Dan Hegemeyer, three uh, state championships, a couple at Fort Lormie, another at New Knoxville. And Doug Krause, whose brother is also in a list that we're going to look at in a minute. Those are the 500 guys we yeah. forgot last week, but you've got the over 300 list you want to talk well, about. Well, we went back and we went through a couple of different websites, and we hope we have them all. We're going to start with Paul Wayne there at 499. Now, we tried to do some math, and if that is correct, he has 499. They have games this week, Tenora does, with Wayne Trace on Friday and Continental on Saturday. He may get to that 500 mark yeah. this weekend. Then we can kind of see down through the list, and we'll just go through them very quickly. Uh, Dave Sweet, obviously, had a great career he had at Ottawa Glandorf. Ray Etzer's on there, who we showed last week. Paul Bremigan, who was at Rushi for a long time, now at Troy. We stuck Larry Clark on there, and you go, what's he on there for? Well, he got a lot of those wins at Crestview, or at the Lincoln View, and is now an assistant at Lincoln View. We saw him the other night. Yeah. Then some other guys up there we see on our list as well. And some active guys, Jim Rookie yeah. at Finley and uh, uh, Kirk Lehman at Defiance. They're still building that uh, total yes, up there. Yes, they are. There's some more guys on our list. Mike Lee, of course, is working with us now. John Von Soss and so on. Dick Heath, who is still the athletic director out at Shawnee. A, a lot of names on our Chris Adams, of course, who got out of coaching high school-wise at kind of an early age to go to you know, UNOH. Who knows what that 380 would have been for him. But a nice list and some really good guys. Yeah, a lot of great coaches from this area. Yeah. Over 300 wins, a whole bunch of them. And if we uh, missed anybody... Well, you can't contact us, so you can let us know. But yeah. we don't have a website or an email or anything like that. So Send us a letter. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. There now you're Coach Sean. Right. You're going to talk about a rule. All right. We're going to look at free throw situations this week. And we kind of got a, a Ben Wright put us a, a picture together for us from that game we did over at Crestview. And we're going to talk about, about seven or eight different things here. First of all, as we do this, the bottom two spaces, these two guys right here are defenders, and those two spaces must be occupied. You cannot shoot a free throw unless those two defenders are there. And I know when sometimes the offensive players go leave and talk to their coach, defensive players must be at least two of them there. The next four guys, that's here, 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 and here, those are optional. Those guys can be there if they choose, these four guys right in here. If they choose, they don't have to be there, but they can if they want. And uh, if they do, the offensive players go first, the defensive players go after them. Well, how about this rule? How far backwards can they go? Have to be within three feet of the line. Three feet of this sideline here, they must be within three feet. Otherwise, they go back here and then go get some fancy rebound thing going on. So they must be within three feet of the side of the free throw lane area. So let's get to the shooter now. What are his responsibilities? Here's the line right here, of course. That's the key. As soon as he shoots the basketball, any of these six players can move. The shooter, bounce pass to the shooter. He has 10 seconds to shoot the basketball. Now, you'll see the official, this one over here, will be responsible for counting his 10 seconds it's not a dramatic move. It's a nice little slow move with your hand or your wrist to count. And it's not big and dramatic like we do with some of our other counts. But he has 
10 seconds to release the ball, and then he may cross that free throw line as well. Now, here's the rule. Here's the free throw line. He can't cross the line to go rebound until the ball hits the rim, nor can this player go cross the line to check him out until the ball hits the rim. So that line, that line right there becomes kind of the demarcation line. Then the other thing we can look at is, what about everybody else? We well, can see this guy's talking to his coach. That's fine. Here's two other guys. There could be three, four, five guys back here. They must be behind the free throw line so that the shooter cannot see them. And unlike in the NBA where we see these guys come charged in as soon as the ball is shot, they may not cross the arc until the ball hits the rim. And then these guys outside the arc can go in and go rebound to basketball as well. And one more thing, Mark, as we get kind of come back here, what about a violation? If it's a defensive violation, the official goes sideways with his arm, that's a delayed violation. If the guy makes a free throw, who cares? Right. Let's just keep yep. playing. Goes like this, and he misses a free throw, guy gets another opportunity. If it's an offensive violation, it's an automatic violation, plays over, we're off we go. All right, good job. Now we understand a lot more what's going on up on those lines, and those rules have changed in recent yeah, years, so you've got to kind of stay up on it. Absolutely. All right, we've got some big games coming up. They get yep. bigger as we go, getting ready for tournament, league championships on the line. A couple of good thir uh, Tuesday night games tonight that we want you to look at. Non-conference play, Perry at 15-3, and three, playing at Miller City, 11-5. and five. Perry, as Mark mentioned, three straight NWCC titles. All five starters from Perry can go double figures any night. They are so hard to concentrate on one or two guys. Miller City in a tie for first place in the PCL with Pandora Gilboa, both with one loss. So this is a big interconference game. Yeah, big thing Tuesday night on the track as well. First of all, we have St. Francis at St. John's. If St. John's wins, they are the league champion. The other part of that is Lima Senior and Finley match up again. This one's at Lima Senior. Finley won the previous game. If St. Francis gets St. John's, Finley has St. John's to play yet, so the race is all over the place yet. But a big game, two big games tonight in the track conference. All right, let's look at this weekend. Friday night, Mark and I will be at the Elida Fieldhouse. Ottawa Glandorf coming down 18-2, 7-0. Oh, the only undefeated team after that win over Wapak last weekend. Elida is 12-6, 6-1. So they're playing for a league championship. Still a game or two to go after this. But this could put them in at least a two-way tie and three if Wapak wins. OG beat Wapak last week by nine and then beat Lexington by one on Saturday. Kaufman and Dybor are the keys inside against Elida, who lacks good team height inside. Those guys are huge, been playing well all year. They only have St. Mary's left after the Elida game. Elida beat Kenton on Friday night in a good game, then lost on Saturday night at Piqua. Unruh is their scoring leader, about 20 a game. They play Bell Fountain tonight, which is a tough test for them, and at Jefferson on Saturday. This is for the WBL Championship. More or less. More or less. You're right there. We'll be have a chance to see that game. Looking forward to that. Let's go to the NWC. And we know that Spencerville is 7-0. We know with that big win they had over Crestview last week. But hanging right on the edge, Delphus Jefferson. They're 5-1. and one. Their only loss in conference play is to buy one point, and that was to Crestview. Stockwell leads him in scoring. He averages 17.5 points a game in Northwest Conference play, does Jay Stockwell. Here's the really big number if you're looking for a number that counts. Duffus Jeff Duffus Jefferson, they give up about 53 points per game on the year. But in NWC play, in those uh, six games they played so far, they've given up 39.8 points per game. They're almost 14 points a game better in defense when they play in conference play, and that will be a key against Spencerville. How about Spencerville? Though? Look who they're playing. Okay, we got Jefferson now. They have LCC on the 21st. One of those two teams will be their first game in the tournament. Oh, boy. There you go. All right. You see that every now and then. We turn right around and play again in the tournament. <laughs> Let's go to the BVC, Pandora Gilboa, 12 and 5, 6 and 2, at Liberty Benton, who is 6 and 3, 9 and 0 oh in the league. Somebody trying to put a blemish on Liberty Benton. Pandora Gilboa beat Delta 58-24, came back the next night, beat Van Lu 66-25. That's an average margin of victory of over 37 points. So they weren't tested last weekend. They have won four in a row, and Drew Johnson had 17 against Delta to lead them. They also play tonight. They have Macomb. Liberty Benton beat Hopewell Loudon by 14. They must slow down Anthony Masterlasco if they expect to play with Liberty Benton. He is phenomenal. Their losses are to Ottawa Glendorf, Wapak, and Rossford in overtime. Those three teams have 46 wins and only 12 losses. They also go to Patrick Henry on Saturday night. Okay, a couple more things really quickly here. Let's look first of all at the SCAL. 
Rushi won the league. They play at Fort Laramie this week, who will finish second, or at least tied with Fairlawn for second. Why is this a big game? Well, Rushi's already beaten uh, Fort Laramie once. If Fort Laramie wins this one, then they're 1-1, one and, one, and they will probably play in the second week of the tournament. Each team will have two games to win before that, which they'll be favored to. So kind of a set that thing up. Can we be 1-1 one and one or 0-2 oh as we head into that? And let's look at the PCL and how that's going to finish up. Right now, because Miller City was upset by Kaleida last week, Miller City is 5-1, and one. Pandora Gaboa is 4-1, and one. Kaleida and Continental setting at 4-2 and 3-2. And and this is a big game for Miller City. If they win against Columbus Grove, they can do no worse than tie for a league championship. PG is hanging in there. They've got Fort Jennings and Continental coming up this weekend. If they're, uh, next weekend, if they get a couple of wins, they can at least tie Miller City, depending on what happens with that game with Columbus Grove. And then you've got two lost Kaleida and two lost Continental set, and they're hoping that you know, Miller City get, and PG each get another loss. So that PCL is wide open right now. Hey, it's a fun time of year. Yeah, it really is. All right, let's see the games on the screen that we're going to be covering. Boy, there's some great ones. Look at that. Finlay and Lima Senior, always a great battle. Got a college game in there. Games all over the place Friday, Saturday, even some being replayed on Sunday. Tournament draws are in. Starting to make the schedule of where we're going to be to show you those games as well. Hey, thanks a lot for joining us on A Closer Look. Mark and I, it's time to have some little chocolate. There we go. See you next Stay week. Here.